Okay, so we've experienced some durians. As you probably experienced, they do have different flavors, just even within this one set. And we talked a lot about Thailand and Malaysia, and how both they have different cultivars, they have different expectations for what they want their durians to taste like, and they also create those flavors based on how they manage their orchards. So we're going to talk a little bit right now about orchard management and harvesting practices that people can use to change the way their durians taste based on what they want. And this is very exciting because it means that durian can be more of like a craft than just a crop. Right? So you can actually change the way that it tastes. You have some artistic influence in creating what you want. Um, so to start with Thailand, the biggest difference in creating those sweet, nutty, non-sulfurous, non non-soft, kind of firm flesh durians is going to be that they cut the durians early. So most durians in Thailand are cut about nine days before they would naturally fall off the tree by themselves. So durians do usually fall off the tree when they're fully mature, but in Thailand they don't want that, they don't want that flavor, so they're going to cut it about nine days early. And you can tell these are all Thai durians here, and they have these long stems, um, and there's a little bit of a knuckle, like there's a little bit of a swelling around the stem where you can see that it would naturally fall. And this is called the abscission point. So, abscission point. So the abscission point has a whole bunch of, of weakened seams that get weakened by ethylene. Um, and so when the, the fruit is ripening and it's releasing ethylene, it um, will weaken along those stems. I think they're called parenchyma stems, parenchyma cells, if I followed my botany class correct. Um, and so naturally, it would fall off here. So you can see it would have this little lump right here, but somebody cut it up there. So that's how they do it in Thailand, and that's kind of how you can tell. Malaysia is going to let them always drop. It's very important in Malaysia that they don't allow them to be cut because it influences the flavor in a way that they don't like. And even if you let a durian that's been cut ripen it, until it's as soft as a durian that fell on its own, it will not taste the same. It will never develop the same palette of flavors. It will remain a little bit sweeter, a little bit fruitier, um, and it will just basically kind of start to ferment in a way that tastes different. So Malaysia always lets them fall, and you can see this one uh, does not have that kind of knuckle, that swollen joint, where it would have um, been cut. So it always falls. So in Thailand, the way that they do this is they are going to cut the durians off. Usually they use some kind of a stick with pruners attached to it. Um, sometimes a guy will actually crawl up in the tree and do that, but durians actually do have very um, weak branches. So you don't want to be walking around too much on your durian branches or they will crack. They're pretty fragile. Um, and so for that reason, people will often crop up the durian branches, especially if you have a durian tree with very big fruits on it. They will crop it up because the durian branches are pretty fragile. So they're going to reach up there, they're going to cut it. A guy is going to stand below the tree with a burlap sack, if you can believe it. This is how they do it, even in high-tech Thailand, right? There's still a guy with a burlap sack in the orchard. So one guy's up in the tree with his cutters. Um, this guy's standing below with the burlap sack. He's going to stand like this, and he's going to hold the sack like this. And as the durian comes up, he's going to whip the sack up like this, and it's going to catch the durian. Very dangerous job. So there you go. And we do get to do this on my tours, so we will all go and harvest durians for the day. So there it goes, you can see the durian falling in right there. Um, this guy's pretty smart. He, he only does it by himself, he doesn't have anyone to help him. So he jerry-rigged this basket. And this is quite a lot of work because you can see there's a ladder right there. And he has to crawl up this ladder to move the basket, and the basket is over a rope. And so he will cut the durians into the basket and then lower the basket. And that's how he harvests his durians. Um, in Thailand, then, because they have all of these unripe durians about nine days early, and so in Thailand they cannot cut the durians before 70% starch content. So durians are very, very starchy um, until they hit about nine days before, which is when they start developing their fats and when they start developing um, their sugars. So in Thailand there is a law that you can't cut the durians before it has 70% starch or you can actually go to jail. And that is a real thing, and every year there are farmers who go to jail for cutting their durians under rice. Hmm. Yes? Wow. <laughs> How are they determining the windows of ripeness for this type of thing, especially when the fruits are so high up in the trees? 
Okay. How they're uh, determining when to cut them would be that every variety has a length of time that it usually takes to ripen. So for Montong, mm -hmm, that'd be 120 days. For Musang King, it's like 95 to 100 days. And it does vary a little bit depending on the weather and the environment. Right, so it's not going to be exactly 120 days. So what they'll do is they'll notice that when it flowers and the fruit sets, so it's when the fruit set, um, the flowers fall off, they'll start counting. At 120 days, they'll go up and they'll harvest maybe five or ten fruits, and they'll take them back to a place where that can test it. They'll cut them open and then we'll test the, the flesh and they'll see you know what percentage it is. And in Thailand, it's very weird because they cut them all at the same time. So if you go to an orchard and like one day after they've just harvested, there are no durians left. So you really have to time your visit or else you'll just miss the harvest. You said about when they let the fruits drop. Yes. Is there an issue with them actually breaking open when they drop and land? Yes, and we'll talk about that shortly. I have some very good pictures for you. Okay. Um, so I was talking about the starch content and the development. So. Um, so then they actually want them to ripen. So they have control over when it ripens. So it's cut about nine days early. And then they're going to paint the stems with something called Ecophon, which is a ripening agent. It has ethylene in it. And they usually color it yellow with turmeric. And this, I think, just might be a cultural practice. They believe that the turmeric goes inside and gives the durian a little bit more color. Because a durian, when it's cut so unripe, it's going to be pure white inside. It's going to have almost no color, no matter what the variety is. And that color develops later. And that, as we said, has to do with the pH. Um, durians are very interesting in the way that they change over their life cycle. And I don't have any like good graphs for you right now, so you just have to believe me. But basically, in the durian, it's about it's mostly just starch and carbohydrate, and it's very high in water content. As it starts to ripen, um, the starches break down into carbohydrates. Um, the pectins also break down. That's when you start having that, that clunky sound, right? Is actually because it dehydrates, the water leaves it. It becomes lower in water. And so the, the durian is actually constricting. So it's getting less watery and more fatty and more, more sugary. And that's when it can start clunking around. You're feeling that, that gap that is forming. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna harvest them though when the durians are very hard and very starchy and very high in water content and heavy. So durians are actually heavier when you harvest them unripe too, which might also be why in Thailand there's a lot of incentive to harvest them unripe because they're heavier and so you can get more money for them, right? And then by the time that they reach their destination, they've ripened and they've lost water, and so then they're going to be lighter weight. And so there's always this difference with the weight. So in Thailand, they're going to paint the stems with this epiphon, which is mixed with turmeric. Don't know if the turmeric actually does its job or not, but this is pretty across the board. And they don't feel bad about these chemical uses. This is just at a normal like durian market. Anywhere you go, that's just like a big wholesale market is going to also sell chemicals for ripening your durians. Ethophon is not legal for use in the United States. I don't know about its health implications. I can't really say anything about that. Um, but that's something to be aware of. Like when you buy durians from Thailand, it has been uh, handled with Ethophon. And sometimes they do get rejected for having to reach this temple. Um, that's something to think about. So here are a bunch of durians from Thailand, and you can see the stems are all yellow. So when you're in Thailand, you see a yellow stem, that's what it is, it's not just paint. It is a ripening agent. And actually, when you go to other countries too, like Singapore, and even sometimes Malaysia, will import durians during the off-season. And you can always tell if they're from Thailand by this yellow spot. Um, so sometimes it means that if you go to a market in Thailand, like this is a huge market called Mong Mai Market near Bangkok, there are no durians you can actually eat at this market. They're all underripe. They've all just been brought there, they're being stored, you cannot eat any of them. And it's very sad because then you're like, yay, I found like the biggest durian market in the world. Oh, there's nothing to eat here. So it's really kind of a mixed emotion there. Um, but that's how it works in Thailand. But it's very handy if you have like a big industrial setup, right, and you're exporting tons and tons of durian, because it means you can store them, you can control how fast they ripen based on when you paint them with the epiphon, you know, so you have a lot more um, options, whereas one that drops, you have very, very, very short shelf life. So it does extend the shelf life quite a bit. Um, actually, the reason why Montong was selected as the export is not because it freezes well. It actually freezes terribly compared to other varieties of durian the texture goes all wrong. But they selected it because it has a lower, um, what's it called, respiration rate. 
So a durian is still a living, breathing thing, even once it's off of the tree. As we're saying, it's losing water, it's still having all of its you know, normal chemical processes, which makes it breathe and respire. Um, and so a montong has a lower respiration rate, which means it ripens more slowly off the tree and has a longer shelf life when it's fresh. As I said, frozen, it's a disaster. I don't know. You know. Unfortunately, that was just sort of a side effect. They had all these montongs, so that's when they wanted to export it. Um, so they have lots of extras. But as we can see, a montong when it's cut, and this is a perfectly ripe montong in Thailand, exactly how they would want it. It is sweet, it is frosting-like, it is a little bit nutty. It's firm, but it has like, um, in Thailand, the very perfect durian texture is going to have a skin on it that's a little bit firm to the touch, but the inside is going to be completely buttery. So a durian ripens from the inside out as well. Um, and so that when you can hold it, when we take a bite out of it, the inside is creamy. It's like a eclair or something like that. That is like a perfect durian texture. Uh, this is a, a, a dropped montong. So this is a montong that fell off of the tree. So you can tell just by the texture that they look pretty different, right? This one is very soft. Montongs actually, when they drop off the tree, they tend to get, you know, mushy, right? They're, like, they're really squishy. You have to like, kind of pull them out. They fall apart because they're so huge. And they also don't ripen evenly. So that's something something you're going to have to address when you get to really big durians, and they often don't ripen evenly. So some parts will remain hard while other parts kind of fall apart and become overripe. Um, and that might be one reason why it is more popular to cut montong, just the uneven ripening. Um, and the flavor profile is extremely different. This one is very, very strong, very eggy, very garlicky. One variety, just the two different ways of dealing with it, a drop versus a cut. We can look again at Huang Mani. So this is again one of my favorite durians. I don't really like it when it's cut because it's very sweet and fruity. But I love it when it's dropped because it kind of develops that like almond nuttiness. But you can tell just by the color. The color difference is pretty extreme, at least in my picture here. I wish you guys could see this. This one is like very pale yellow. This one is very dark orange. One variety, just you know, cut versus drop. Again, we have a ganyao. This one is cut, very pale yellow. It's kind of hard and it doesn't really have any wrinkles to it. This is a ganyao. It's dropped. It's a nice, bright, golden yellow color. Um, and so one of the things with durians when they're dropped is that they don't last very long at all. And they actually have their own lactobacillus bacteria inside called lactobacillus durian. I'm not making that up. And so it actually ferments. Um, this is tempoyak. So durian begins to bubble and ferment and becomes um, sort of like a probiotic. And they eat this in Malaysia. They call it tempoyak and they'll use it to cook with. So you got these two different things where in Thailand, you know, we've got durians that are going to be kind of underripe with longer shelf life. In Malaysia, you're always going to be kind of pushing the timeline, you know, how fast you can get this durian to market before it turns into its own tempoyak. How do you spell the fermented? Tempoyak is T-E-M-P-O-Y-A-K. Tempoyak. Um, and so in Malaysia, you know, we're always going to be looking out for bad durians. So when a durian becomes overripe, there's a bunch of different things that happen with the flesh um, that you can look at. So for one area, my favorite word, funiculus, is going to turn gray. So it should be white. When you open up that durian, that inside portion should be white. If it's gray, that's a really good sign that it is overripe. Um, the bubbles will actually begin to form in the flesh. You'll kind of see that it looks foamy. It's got like little holes in it. Um, and that is a sign that it is a fermenting. Doesn't mean it tastes bad, it might still taste really good to you know, people do eat tempoyak and like it, and I like it, fine, I'll eat it, you know, I'll use it as a dip for vegetables or something like that. But that is a sign that it is overripe and maybe not at its best stage. The skin will become more and more fragile, so it'll lose that kind of eclair-like um, thickness that the ties like so much. And it'll become so fragile that it'll start breaking by itself in different places and become very messy and very soft. Where you have to kind of scoop it out with your fingers. Um, and the flesh will just become more watery and it will start to lose some of the stickiness and the flavor and the oomph. You know, it'll become less sweet, a little bit more acidic. And we actually do know that when durians fall off the tree by themselves, they're about 7 uh, pH. And by the time that they're tempoy off, they're about 4. So the pH does change. Um, and there are different areas that do prefer their durians like this. So like in Indonesia, they actually like durians that I personally consider overripe. 
and that's just a cultural preference. So that's something that else you guys can be aware of. But um, because the Malaysians are always fighting this overripeness, you know, they want to extend their shelf life as long as possible. One of the ways that they're going to do that is by preventing the durian from hitting the ground. And they're going to actually tie them onto the tree. So this is actually, each one of these strings is attached to a durian. So there's some durians. I don't know if you can see the strings wrapped around them. But when they fall, the durians are just going to dangle there. And they're never going to touch the ground. And preventing that impact is going to keep them um, from going ripe as quickly. So actually sometimes when durians first drop, they are going to have that tie texture a little bit. And um, you have to wait a little bit for them to soften up. So this is just one way of preserving them a little bit longer. The other way they would do that is in a net. So a lot of times they put nets all over their property you know, across the roads. It's not just to protect us, it's actually more about extending the shelf life of the durian. Because if you hit, if you prevent it from having that impact, it will last longer. Um, and they've been doing nets for a really long time. I was totally stoked because of the nerd to find this woman who traveled alone in Malaysia in the 1800s, which is just incredible, right? I mean, she was one of the first travel writers to go there, and she's a woman in a very, very sexist country at that time. Um, but anyway, she she found all these nets spread everywhere, and I thought it was cool to kind of see that that's a very long-term cultural practice. But one of the reasons they might do it too is that the hills in Malaysia are real. Like in Malaysia, they almost only grow durians on hillsides, so that's great because durians really do like a lot of drainage. Um, they really don't like to be sitting in water. They're very susceptible to root rots. So having them on a hill actually does make the trees very healthy. But it does mean that when your durians fall, because you're not cutting them, they are going to fall down the hill and bounce away. And I've been standing right here and seen a durian come tumbling down this hill, hit this bit of concrete right here, and then just like launch itself, right? So it's a little bit dangerous. Uh, and you can know that you, then you're either going to have to go like looking for that durian down the hill in your neighbor's property. You know, which if it's a moose on king or something, you just lost a lot of money or that durian is just really banged up and damaged and it's going to go bad really quickly. So nets are a great way of keeping your durians on your property. Durians in Malaysia are really tall. So we talked about how durian trees can live to be like hundreds of years old. Um, they can also be a few hundred feet high. And that would be one reason why they're not cutting them there, because no one's going to climb that thing and cut them down. So they're going to be catching them in nets. And of course, the higher the tree, the more impactful faster it will go back. Um, the other reason is that Malaysians believe that older trees have a stronger tasting durian fruit. So they think that the wine and the bitter comes out as the durian tree matures. So um, they are going to treasure their old trees, they're going to try to keep them alive, and they're going to let them grow to crazy heights. Um, and that's partly what they're going to do in Malaysia. And because they want to preserve those really old trees, their grafting techniques are going to be different as well. So this is actually a, this is about a 15 year old graft on a 30 year old uh, rootstock. And so they believe that it's all about the roots and maintaining that root system and getting those roots really deep and um, being able to bring up the nutrients and that's what gives the better taste of the fruit. Um, and so if you ask them, it's a little bit of a cheat, you know, if they want to put on a new variety like a Muson King or Blackthorn that is getting a lot more money than the older varieties, they will graft it onto a rootstock uh, is very old, and then when you ask them, hey, how old is your, you know, your blackthorn, your Musang King, they're like, oh, it's like 40 years old. And they're like, wait, they didn't have blackthorn 40 years ago, right? <laughs> so it gets very tricky when you're like trying to figure out what people have, um, and I'm not sure that it actually does have as good quality, um, even when it's drafted like this, but you get a lot of really funky looking orchards in Malaysia where it's just like they just grafted at random all over the, the tree trunks. And it also means that they're much more willing to change varieties if there's like a new fat. So if they find out that a new durian came up and it's being charged, you know, 150 ring a kilo, they're like, great, I'm just going to like graft that one onto the side of my tree. And uh, we'll try that one out. So they're much more flexible that way. Thailand, totally different setup. They're cutting their durians, right? So they want to keep all their trees really low. So in Thailand, you're going to find that trees top out at like 20 or 30 feet. They don't really let them get higher, and they're actually going to top them if they start growing too high. Um, and they spend a lot more time training them so that the lateral branches go out flat, right? So they spend a lot more time like pruning and managing their trees so that they can cut them uh, and make that easier. But having it on the flat ground, because in the areas like Chanterbury, it's very, very flat. Um, 
Uh, so one thing that they can do because their trees are so much lower is that they can also do things like foliar sprays much more easily. So they'll do a lot of their fertilizing through like foliar sprays, um, as well as like different chemical practices for like, managing pests and stuff. But because their um, properties are so really flat, there's a lot more problems with drainage and a lot more problems with um, root rots. And that's partly why they're spraying more than in Malaysia. Um, and that's just part of their practice there. And because they're trying to prevent the root rots, they have a lot of other weird grafting techniques that have happened over the last few years. And this is one that was very popular in like maybe the 80s. And they thought that if they took three rootstocks and braided them together, that was going to make the tree a lot stronger and less susceptible to root rots. So you get these really weird orchards that have like three or four trees like stuck together. It looks like a bunch of little like animals when like you came to like a zoo or something. Um, so I find that one very interesting. And this fell out of fashion. It turned out not to, not to work that well. Um, at least some people still do it, but it's not that popular anymore. But uh, Thailand. So they are like grafting in mass. As I told you about the Montong and the Chinese really, really love durian. So they are just trying to pump out as much durian as they possibly can. There are new programs in Thailand where they actually pay the farmers to keep the seeds. And these farmers can sell their seeds back to the government or they can grow them into nurseries. So this is a nursery that I went to. Um, I went to this one area in Southern Thailand and literally for like more than a kilometer, both sides of the road were just baby durians. So these are all montong. All of them. I stopped and talked to the guy. And they're about this tall, which means they're probably about two years old. Um, and they're all grafted montong. And it's just, I don't even know how deep it goes, but it was like kilometers on the side of the road. And it's a government program. Um, and they're shipping these, these montongs all over Thailand to uh, start more so that they can feed the China, the China bellies. Um, what do I say here? But the way that they method that they use, um, so here's the side of the road where I found all of those, it's going on forever. So the way that they start their durians is they're not going to bury the seeds. So they're going to put all of the durians, usually just in a big flat, flat area, and they just stick the durian seeds on top. And then sometimes they'll just like throw a little bit of like moss or something on top to keep it moist if it's a dry time. Um, moisture is going to be the most important thing for starting your durian seeds. They like about 80% humidity. Um, and they just kind of throw them on top and then they start sprouting. And durian seeds are really bizarre in the way that they sprout. Um, there aren't a lot of other things like them and I've actually seen some references to them having their own type of germination. It's called durian germination. You can look this up. Um, apparently they're different. I'm not a botanist so I'm not really going to try to explain it too much except for the fact that they keep the seed on like over their leaves until it's pretty big. So you can see this is like a, this is a baby durian coming up. It still has the seed shell like stuck around it. And um, this is one when it's about two months old. And so durian trees are also kind of unique, I think, because they have this big fat hypocotyl. So there's like two parts here. This is the epicotyl, the stem, and then it has this big part called a hypocotyl in the bottom. And not all trees have that, or it can be like really small. And I'm not a botanist again, so if I'm getting anything wrong here, somebody please just raise your hand and correct me, and then I can learn it as well. But here in Hawaii, um, it's really popular to graft into the hypocotyl. And I've never seen that done anywhere else. So I don't know how much you guys are into grafting. People want to do that for themselves, or just want to buy the tree. But here in Hawaii, it seems like that's the way that they're doing it. Um, but I have not seen that in Malaysia, and I have not seen that in Thailand. Um, and I had a video for you, which I guess can't be loaded, but it was just showing some friends of mine um, just grafting and the way that they do it. And they're really fast about it because they do like hundreds a day. You know, they're just like sitting there like boom, boom, boom. And they actually graft into the apicotyl. They usually wait until the durian tree is about a year old. So unlike the hypocotyl, which is two months, They'll wait until the tree is about a year old and they'll just go out and do a whole bunch at once. And they graft into the epicotyl. Um, and the difference is that when you do hypocotyl grafting, if you mess up, you just kill the tree. With epicotyl grafting, if you mess up, the tree probably still going to live. And you can just try again. 
so that's one of the differences. And it's just really easy, and it seems like in Thailand and Malaysia they don't, they have a pretty high success rate, like 90% success rate. Here in Hawaii it seems like there's a lot more struggle. I've heard numbers as low as 15 or 20% success, and I don't know what the difference is there. Um, but we're talking about, you know, cutting versus um, dropping. My friend Peter Solaris in Australia thinks he has the perfect in-between. So he's convinced that he can grow durians on a trellis. Anybody heard about trellising durians before? Yeah, so this is really exciting because it means that you get all the super management practices of Thailand, but you can still get a higher quality fruit. You know, it's closer to the dropping point because you can actually tell on the durian when it's going to drop by itself because that abscission point that we talked about, that like knuckle, the little line, it widens, it gets a gap. You can see that there's like a white line there right before it's going to drop. And so Peter thinks that if he keeps the trees really small, you know, at like eye level, you can just like walk along and check on them and like notice like when that's forming and then you can cut it. You know, just like the same day it would have dropped or the day before it would have dropped. So it would be drop quality, but um, a little bit earlier so it has a little bit longer shelf life. And there's all kinds of really cool things about this management practice. Um, he does, it does take a lot of work. As you can see, you know, he's taken the durian tree and like, trained it along um, the lines here, so it's very like lateral, but you're taking a tree that wants to be like 200 feet tall and making it only 9 feet tall. So it takes a lot of pruning. Um, he thinks it's worth it because of some of the benefits. As we talked about here in Hawaii, it seems like you guys don't have a lot of really um, stable seasons or stable pollination. So one of the things that he can do for that um, is that he can control the water. So durians need at least two weeks of, um, I think I'm doing this backwards, how I wanted to. So he can control, he can just choose when he wants to cut it. He can control pests easier so he doesn't have to spray as much. And then he um, also can control the water. So here he has shade cloth stretched over the, the whole row. And so he can control how much sun that they get. He can also control how much water they get. So he can cover them and make sure they don't get any water when he wants to, or he can uncover them and water them himself. You know, so he's got a lot of different things that he can do for control. Um, and part of that is the flowering. Because durians need at least two weeks minimum of no water to flower. They actually have a pretty big stress. If you look on your papers, you'll notice that I put like how much water those places get during the low season. So um, places like Chanterbury. You know, they have a pretty high annual rainfall. Chanterbury is 117 inches a year, but there's about two or three months where they get less than an inch a month. It's like very, very dry and it's very hot. And that's what inspires durians to flower. So places like here in Hawaii, where it seems like you guys have more regular rain, um, it rains more often, it means your trees probably aren't getting that stressor. Right? They're not getting stressed into flowering on a, like, an annual basis. It seems like it's a little bit more random here. Does that seem right? Well, it depends. I mean, I've, I've, there's places up on Hak in, in um, uh, up Hamakua that basically fruit every 200 days. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have a pr we have a mini drought uh, at each of the uh, after each of the solstices, or right around the solstice time. Okay. So winter and summer. So there's a late winter drought, mini drought, and then there's a there's a uh, um, midsummer mini drought, and then the bulk of the rain comes. Um, right after the equinoxes, so oh. November, December, lots of rain, normally, okay. and uh, uh, April, March, April too. Okay, so you do have kind of a, a stable season here. Yeah, Oscar. This year was very unusual. We had a very dry summer. That's why there's so many durians around. Right. It's, it doesn't happen very often. Usually the rain is spread very well throughout the year, with winter being extremely heavy rainfall. But the pattern is with perhaps with global warming that the rainfall is getting lost and lost. So for durians that might be good. Why? Yeah. Uh, it's been a very unusual year in Malaysia and Thailand as well. Um, the rains didn't come at the time they normally do so like last spring it just like rained through the entire dry season and then like after the dry season was came it, then it was dry for its two weeks and so the durian season was like three months late. It was bizarre, um, but that's kind of how they go, you know, it's just you watch the rain and you kind of know 
if you're going to have flowers or not because it needs that stressor. It needs those two weeks of dry minimum to put out flower buds. And the flowering is actually fairly slow. Um, so this is where it starts. This phase lasts a couple of months. It's just like these little things that come out. Um, and then they swell and they become like more normal looking flower buds. And this hangs around for a couple of weeks. And then they open really quickly. So they go from this to like oh that in like one night. It's like suddenly they just all open. Um, and I actually set up a camera this last summer and did some time lapse work, which was super fun. You know, I got to catch all kinds of bugs and centipedes and different things that were visiting the flowers. Um, and also just see how quickly they open. And it turns out they open in about 20 minutes. So they go from a bud, just like boom, all the way open, um, which is beautiful. And it's usually about 3.30 in the afternoon is when they open. So they are night flowers. They're um, mostly active between about 3.30 or 4 and about 8 to 9 at night is kind of when they do. And when you wake up in the morning, um, so here's what they look like when they're open. They're beautiful. They smell great. And you can actually eat the anthers. So a lot of people will stir fry them during the season because when you wake up in the morning, they're gone. They all fell in the night. And this is what's left. And this little part right here is a baby Dorian. So, and so all that flower stuff, you can stir fry it for your breakfast if you want it. Um, so then they become something like this. And most of these fall. So there are way more flowers and way more baby durians than there will actually be durian fruits. So we'll get to that stage. Everyone likes to joke that they look like little earrings. They're like, oh, it should be durian earrings. Um, and then they grow. Most of these will also fall. So by the time you get your durians, you only have maybe one or two of these durians left. Um, and you can increase this by pollination. So durians pollinate mostly by bats and beetles at night. And in places like Thailand, where they've kind of killed off most of their bats, they have to do a lot of hand pollinating. And this is also where, like, um, Peter thinks that having a really low trellis will make things easy because it's very easy to hand pollinate, and he can make sure that he gets very high yields. Uh, and I have a video here of some guys hand pollinating, but I don't know if I can access it without the internet. Um. We can, so, yeah. What about we show them at the end and then just okay. show a couple of videos? And yeah, for sure. Password. Cool, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, so it's just they use a feather duster, like a broom, a broom or a feather duster, and they basically just run the feather duster across all the flowers. So it's, it's pretty easy, but that's how they do it in Thailand, and having those trees be low makes it so that they can do that. So, you know, they can access that with a broom. Um, Malaysia, they don't hand pollinate at all because the trees are just way too tall and those, those flowers are way too high up, so they don't do that. Um, Thailand, they always have underripe durians, right? So when you go to a market, you're always going to be watching out to see if they have underripe durians or not. And the way that they test if the durian is ripe is in Thailand, they'll cut you a triangle. And so you can do this for yourself when you have durians and you want to see if yours are ripe. So you cut a triangle and you poke it. Um, in Thailand, it's very bad manners to taste it, which is different than Malaysia. In Malaysia, you're allowed to go and pinch a little bit and then taste it to see if it tastes good. In Thailand, you just poke it and see if it's soft. She'll get mad at you if you taste it. Mm -hmm. um, and she's very sweet. So, um, you always check the top. Because as we were saying, durians ripen from the bottom to the top. So, um, if you want to know, you know, if a durian is ripe on the bottom, it may not be on the top. But if it's ripe on the top, it's definitely ripe on the bottom. So, you want to check that for Thailand. So they are opening it again. Um, and in Malaysia, they'll always do it from the bottom, so it's opposite. So in Thailand, they'll check it for you on the top to make sure it's all the way right. In Malaysia, they'll do it on the bottom because you want to check that it's not overripe. Right, so if it ripens from the bottom to the top in Malaysia, if the bottom is uh, perfectly ripe, you know the top is not too ripe. So that's how that goes. Um, and we can tell a lot by the stem in Malaysia by how long it fell off of the tree. So you want to get ones that look very fresh. This area shouldn't be brown, it should be green on the top. So you can see these are all extremely fresh and good quality. Um, okay. And um, in Malaysia, the ones that they really want are when they're still sticky, sticky with sap. So this is the sap that's during, like basically just fell. And the only way you can get that is if you go to the farm itself. And so in Malaysia, there is a really big you know, thing that they will actually go to farms, spend the night, hang out, wait for the durians to drop, so they can get that sticky sap, which makes them know that they're getting like a really high quality special fruit. When durians get dried out, you should not buy them. 
So when you see a stem that's like this, it's all wrinkled, it's all shriveled up, you know, browned, it looks dry. It means that durian has been off the tree for a really long time. And that's true in Thailand and it's true in Malaysia. It's more dangerous in Malaysia because you know that it's going to be overripe and fermented, but in Thailand it just means that someone cut it underripe and then just let it sit around to like kind of soften up and it's not going to taste good, it's just going to be soft. Uh, and you can see that here in like, if you go to like the Hilo market, like go to the Hilo farmer's market and just look at the stems, you'll see tons of them that just look like super trashed and old. Uh, so you kind of just know what you're looking for there. Um, you won't want to buy durians that are yellow in color. So when durians ripen, they go from a green or a brown, and they slowly turn more and more yellow and even orange. So you don't want to be buying durians that are a yellow color generally. There are a few varieties that are more yellow in color naturally, but it's just really uncommon. So that's sort of general across the board. If it has a dried stem and it's yellow in color, it's a very old durian, and that's true in Thailand and Malaysia. Um, a lot of times vendors will cover their stems so you don't know what you're looking at. So you're saying it's one reason to keep them fresh is to keep the dehydration. Um, it keeps them from oxidizing as quickly, but it's also a way of just fooling your consumer into not knowing what the stem looks like so you can't tell how old it is or how long it's been off the tree. Um, durians will open by themselves when they get old enough. So when they get dehydrated, we're talking about the ripening process, they lose their water, their breathing, whatever, they actually dehiss, which means that the bottom opens along the seams by itself. This is not a good sign. There's a lot of people who say that this is when you should eat a durian because it's when you would like naturally eat it in the forest. And I'm telling you, you cannot outcompete a sun bear or an elephant or a tapir. So by the time a durian is doing this, it's gone. So a durian, you're never going to find just open durians like this in the natural forest. Um, and this is a sign to me that the durian is old, it's going to taste watery, and it's going to be slightly fermented inside. If you like that, if fermented is your jam, go for it. But that's not what I like. Um, having durians at different ripenesses means you're going to use different tools to open them. In Malaysia and Penang especially, where I am used to opening durians, we use very small knives. And partly this is sort of a craftsmanship because it's very important to them that they open the durians without cutting through the seeds. They believe if you cut through the seed, then it makes it more bitter. It has sort of like um, a flavor that comes out. The seeds are very gooey, so you don't want to cut through that seed. You also don't want to cut through the outer skin because they want to have a very nice presentation. So they're going to use a very small knife. Um, and they're going to go do like I did, where you cut along the sides, along the seams, and you pull it in half very carefully. So this is a, an old durian farmer in Malaysia who is opening a durian. In other parts of Malaysia, they're going to use bigger knives. So like in Singapore, they like to use a cleaver, and they will actually take their glove, they'll stick it in one hand, and it's like a, it's like being a pizza man, you know, the guy who like flips the pizza thing, and they all have their own style, and it's sort of like a dance or whatever. The guys in Singapore do this as well, and they all have their own little flares for how they move the durian when they're, they're whacking it open with a cleaver. And a lot of times they'll do this little like flare at the end where they pull it open like this, and like, just crack it a little bit so you can see the color. Um, and so that's sort of a Singaporean thing to do. There he is, opening the durian with some flair. Um, and they also like to give a presentation like this. So when they serve it to you, they're going to pile it all up so it looks very abundant. This is like several different pieces of durian that are all stacked on top of each other. Um, and that's how they like to do it. They also have durian opening machines, which we use. I don't really like them because it makes it look very messy. Um, and they're very usefulness. They use them in a lot of like industrial settings. Um, and people think it's really fun, right? So I've got a kid here. Kids love these things because it's very easy to open the durian. You just set it in the hole with the stem down, and then you take that sharp bit and just plunge it into the bottom, and then you pull it apart. So that's how those work. Very common. You get to Thailand, you have durians that are unripe, right? So they are not going to open along the seam no matter what you do. You just have to cut those things open. Um, and so the way that they do it is they're going to use a really big sharp knife, and they're going to cut in between the locules. As I was saying, like, don't do that earlier when I was opening it. That's how they're going to do it in Thailand, but they're going to use a huge knife for it. And they're going to cut it out like it's a, like a section. So there's a lady with a big, huge knife. Very, very sharp. And she's cutting that thing into pieces, right? And then she's going to have, like, a wedge of durian. It's all sealed inside of its little case. Um, and she's going to cut that open down along the seam, like that. And then she can just kind of peel it open. And it's very tidy. And um, it is kind of a nice way to do it when it is a very hard shell and very difficult to open durians. And then they can lay it out like this. 
So this is how a Thai person would prefer to display their durian for you to eat. is something like this, where they're all laid out with their half shell. And because they have more unripe durians lying around, Thailand you're always going to have heaps of them, they figured out ways to cook them, things to do with their unripe durians. So again, for you, if you have durians that fall off of your tree unripe, during a storm, when it rains, when it's windy, something like that, these are some things that you can do with them. So a very popular one would be durian samtam. This is one of my favorite things because I don't know if you guys had samtam before. It's that papaya salad. You know, it's very vinegary, lemon, sweet, usually very spicy and salty. I mean, they just like throw in the spices. But they'll do it with durian. And the great thing about unripe durian flesh is because it's kind of starchy, it really absorbs the flavors really well. Um, and it has a little bit of a rubbery texture, and I've been told by people who come on my tours that it tastes like mozzarella cheese. But it just like absorbs all that vinegar and that lime juice, and it's very, very tasty and flavorful. Um, another thing we'll do with it is cook it into curries. So when you cook unripe durian flesh, it becomes soft like a very sweet potato. Um, kind of very rich and buttery. So this is a masaman curry. You do it with peanut sauce. That would be a common thing to do with it. They're also going to slice it and fry it into chips. And these taste basically the same as lay potato chips, just a little bit sweeter. Um, and I fed these to my family at family reunion and they didn't notice the difference. So that was kind of a fun experiment. <laughs> and they'll also candy it. So this is a little bit like a canned pear or something like that. They'll take the unripe durian chucks and they'll just like boil it with sugar. Um, and that becomes like a, a, a canned pear kind of texture. It's very, very sweet. In Malaysia, we're always battling having too much overripe durian around. If you didn't sell your durians for the day, you can't sell them tomorrow, right? They're going to be like vinegar. No one's going to want them. They're bad now. So people are finding out ways to what they can do with their ripe durian or overripe durian. Simpoyak is one. They're going to make a sauce out of it. They're going to they, they pound this with chilies and shrimp usually into a sambal, which they'll eat with rice or they'll eat with curry. Um, they will also use the ripe flesh when it's really soft. Uh, they will make cakes with it and use it as a replacement for frosting. That's a really great thing to do with durians. They'll fill stuff with it. So this is a mochi ball that they filled with pure durian flesh. And as I was saying, D24, right? Almost all these bakeries use D24 because it's like the old commercial variety. So there's still tons of them around, but they can't get the prices for it for the Muson King, so they just make paste out of it. They will make their desserts with it. So this is a chendol. It's like a fluffy ice. A dessert with like these noodles and like sweet beans because the Malaysians love their beans sweet and they'll put durian on top of it. Very very common dessert that you'll find in Malaysia when you're traveling. And then everybody will take their leftover durian, Thais, Malaysians, Indonesians, and they'll make guan out of it. So this is like a durian jelly or durian jam. This is the traditional way of preserving durians because durians when they fall all at once you'll find yourself suddenly with just like a lot of durians. I don't know if everybody's experienced that grows them, right? It's just like no durians, lots of durians. And so they would want to preserve these if you're a tribe living in Malaysia so that you can eat it for longer. And they would just cook it. So back in the day, they would stand around a walk like this. And this takes about six hours of just pushing the durian flesh back and forth across this walk over this nice smoky thing. It actually absorbs the smoke. Um, it tastes very good, but these ladies are just going to be standing there for six hours with paddles. Um, just stirring this thing around. Today they usually use a mixer, so this is a much easier, lazier way of doing this. But it's very delicious, especially when it's hot and becomes very sweet and condensed. Um, and so that is a great way to use your excess durians. This is how they would sell it. Town or Malaysia, they'll put it in tubes. You can slice it up, eat it with rice, put it on a sandwich, or just eat it plain. Um, so that kind of concludes my slides for the moment. I know we do have some questions that I haven't totally addressed, so um, let's just jump into that. Let's start did, with you. Did those tubes of paste, does that last unrefrigerated forever, basically? Two months. Two months. Unless you add sugar. Okay. So there's two different kinds, some with sugar and some without. Um, I prefer the ones without. It's called guan, G-U-A-N. There's a, if you look on your handout, I put a, a link to the durian recipes. So I do have a section on my website that's just dedicated to durian recipes. And you'll find a lot of the stuff and ideas for what to do with their durians when they're ripe or unripe or just excess. Yeah. Would that include like a lacto-fermented pickle durian? 
Um, well, the lactobacillus is once it's sort of squishy. I don't think you could pickle it really. But it is a nice, like, creamy thing you could put on stuff, like a sandwich. Okay. Thanks. You talked about the entire You showed that she was wiping out the unripe ones. And then you also showed earlier that they were using chemicals to ripen them. Yeah. If you have one that's off the tree that's unripe, it will not ripen on the counter if you wait long enough. It's just going to go bad. It depends on that starch level. So we're saying in Thailand you can go to jail if you pick a durian less than 70% starch content, mm -hmm. um, which is about. 15 days before it would naturally fall by itself. If you pick it before that point, it will not ripen. It will just go bad. It'll soften.